You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. My name is Terrence Doyle. And I'm Chris Lopez. You probably know us from the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Ride Along Show. Well, now we're talking everything multifamily. We bring in top industry experts from around the country to come join us in our Denver studio for an in-depth, in-person conversation. We're gonna be diving deep into deals, underwriting, raising capital, and everything in between. Join the conversation. All right, we're in episode two with Van and Kyle on the Multifamily Mentor Show. We have them sitting down with two investors to go over one of their deals. Terrence, who'd you bring into the conference room? Yeah, two super sophisticated, institutional, savvy investors in Denver. They see all kinds of deals from private equity, venture, real estate, and they're tough. And so I was really pleased and proud of how they handled it. I think the audience is gonna get a lot out of the feedback they gave and anyone raising money, I think you're going to be able to take some application from it. So check it out, leave some comments, talk about what you like, talk about what you learned and go use the information. All right, great. Gentlemen, thank you for taking the time uh, to look at this investment opportunity. We'd love just to, before we get started, hear a little bit about your guys' background and what you're looking for specifically in investments um, and just take it from there. Sure, so we worked at the same company for a while. Um, company got acquired and we were fortunate enough to kind of get out with some capital. We don't know a ton about real estate, but we're definitely, we heard good things about you guys and we're interested in stuff that has good yield, good returns, um, asset backed or, so look, curious to see if that fits the bucket. Anything else? That's it. Probably it'd be helpful to us if you just kind of gave us a quick landscape, you know, what, what all kinds of real estate are there and then focus on maybe, you know, what the risk and what an investor would expect. Absolutely. So we're a multifamily specific firm. We focus on value add multifamily, typically B and C class areas of workforce housing, blue collar tenants trying to find positions to add value. So my first kind of goal in this conversation is really just to see if that's a good fit for you guys. Um, and moving forward with that. So we'd love just to, you know, are you familiar with value add multifamily? Would you like me to explain the dynamics of it or what's your familiarity with you that? You explain that and also what, what is the difference between B and C? Mm, okay. Yeah. So if I could kind of like lay the landscape as far as real estate investing, because like I said, we're multifamily and what we do is we raise money from private investors as equity. Um, so when people think of investing in real estate, sometimes they might buy a rental property, they might own the thing, they might manage it. Um, but what we do is we take checks from private investors as passive investors. So they don't actually, they're not involved with the day-to-day -day management of the deals. They just write a check and then they get their yield. Um, they're direct owners in the company. And so that's what we do um, for our properties. And we focus specifically on multifamily. Multifamily is very resilient. People always need a place to live. Um, and then it, it gets really good debt. And then we're able to structure the deals with typically better yield because you have a really stable cash flow coming in from the high volume of tenants. Um, so when you say good debt, so these things are levered? They are levered. How much? Uh, it depends on the deal. Um, typically value add, you wanna make sure you don't over leverage, but you can also um, be very flexible as far as how much equity you're raising. We typically aim for like 75%. Um, on a value add deal, we might get loan to cost, which means we can also lever construction costs, um, which can really help with yield, and uh, that can be up to 80%. When we get pitched on these deals, we, we, we hear A, B, and C a lot, and mm -hmm. everyone seems to have a different definition. To you guys, what is the difference between class A, class B, and class C, and then what does that mean in your particular investment strategy? I think the build year is probably the most tangible way to represent the classes. So typically, we'll see C class being 1970s and older, and then you'll see 1980s to 1990s BB, and 1990s to newer. Typically, fall in that A class, there's some disparity between those two, and it's kind of a little bit homogenous between small barriers, but I've seen, I think build year be probably the best way to represent that as well as income level of the tenants in the, the surrounding area as far, how close are they to the median income and how far away are they? And from an equity perspective, your A-class stuff is gonna be really nice class, higher rents, um, typically better locations, uh, which is gonna mean probably lower yield, better appreciation. Um, and then there's the B-class, which you can kind of, you know, maybe a slightly less nice area, a little bit lower income, still very quality um, housing. And then C-class would be more your workforce housing. So that would be a little bit lower income. Um, and then that would be more value add. So as you kind of go down um, that spectrum, you're creating potentially more yield and more potential to add value. Because in an A-class, there's gonna be less work to do, less meat on the bone. Uh, 
you know, speaking figuratively. So as you go down, there's more opportunity to get in. There's inefficiencies in that market, so you can get in, renovate the units, bring the rents up, refinance, you know, which typically can give you really attractive yields. Um, so that's what we focus on is the BNC because we have the opportunity to go in with our construction background and actually add value to the property, um, which we can then pass on to investors as opposed to just uh, buying and holding for a long time in A class. So what kind of yield? Uh, so if we invest, what what would we expect? Uh, what would our experience be like year one, year two, year three? Mm -hmm. You know, focus on yield and then you can finish with what happens at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the best ways to do it would be to maybe go through this specific property and start to give you some understanding as to what offering we have right now, what that year one and year two and year three looks like. Sure. So if you want to take a look, I'll show you right here on the slide. Here we go. So if you can see here, we have the years one, two, and three, and we are focused on yield in this chart. So, it's so actually, where is this property? This property is in Austin, Texas. Higher real estate has gone up like a crazy amount. Is it a good time? Yeah, it's a fantastic time. The amount of drivers as far as employee growth and population growth and rent growth in that area are phenomenal, and we don't really see them going anywhere because they are tech-based, and that's kind of the way the economy is moving, and we're seeing large companies and large CEOs moving big parts of their companies to Austin, Texas. And as you asked the yield, um, we are buying in Austin, which is an extremely hot market. You know, most rent growth, most population growth, mo most job growth in the entire country, which is a very attractive market and product is priced appropriately. Um, and what that means is the yield is not going to be as competitive as other markets because the appreciation is priced in, which is what can be really attractive. But a deal like this is where we go in, we find an under market deal where we can go in, get really good debt on it, like we said. Um, bridge debt that allows us to finance our construction costs. We can renovate the thing, get rents up to where they need to be, refinance the deal, and then have a lower basis that we have much better yields on. So then we can kind of stratify those two things and sit on a really great appreciating asset in Austin while at the same time actually delivering yields. So what's, what's your, it looks like you get about half your money back after the refinance, is that right? Yeah, that is correct. So what's your leverage in, at start, and what's your leverage when you do the refinance? So our projected leverage is about 78% loan to cost, so that's um, the down payment purchase price of the property as well as the construction costs. And how many units is this property? 44 units. Is that consistent with the type of deals you've done before? Yeah, we actually own the 42 unit directly next to, uh, store sharing the fence. So it'll help us scale our management, get efficiencies there on payroll. Um, and we also know the submarket, know the tenants. We've successfully gotten rents in this area to the part we know, and we also have the comp right next door. So so when you're, you said value add, so on this unit next door, what, what does that mean? Like, what do you guys do? You buy it and then what happens? Yeah, so we bought it with one beds at around 975 per rent, and we put $10,000 in per door, and we just leased at 1250. So we've gotten significant rent bumps. Part of that is from the organic growth in Austin, Texas. It's about 18% since January, but also just the amount of value we were able to see, 975 being way under the market rent and us being able to bring it up to 1250. Now we have the property next door. They're a little bit smaller units, but they're comparable and they're also significantly under rent with the opportunity to be raised. So you've already refinanced that property? We have not refinanced the 42 unit, but we've proven the, the value add strategy. What's your biggest lesson you've learned? I think the biggest lesson for us is really just understanding how to turn units in an efficient way. And now we had a little bit of a supply chain issue with the COVID and, and actually getting supplies directly. We've had a workaround, we've been direct to supplier, and now we actually get equipment a lot quicker. We've uh, halted some of the stainless steel because they're harder to get. We've gone in with black, gotten tenants in, changed the countertops and kind of made a mixture of our original renovation plan, still got the rents, but able to get equipment here quicker just from us solving some supply chain issues. So that's probably been the biggest, biggest lesson so far. The 78% debt that you're taking on, what kind of debt is that? So that's a bridge loan, um, which means we have a floating rate with a actual um, rate cap purchased, which means we're at a four and a half percent rate. Um, we've worked with this lender before, uh, very seamless process, easy close, uh, best terms we can find. Especially, it's, it's very difficult to find debt under $5 million, um, but we're able to find that attractive bridge debt that we can then um, either sell out of inside of four years, because we have three years plus one year extension, or we can refinance out of it. And then the, at the refi, you know, you're, you're saying you get roughly half your principal back. What decides the price of this thing at the refi? So it'll be appraised um, by the bank as we go back um, for whoever the lender's coming in that we're going to get the new loan for. 
So they'll appraise the property, and typically they do that on a cap rate basis. That's how we model it. Um, so we'll look at our NOI, what's our historical income, um, what's the market supporting, and then depending on that appraised price, that's what kind of loan proceeds we'll get, and then we'll use those loan proceeds to pay off our existing loan and then investors. So Jay was our CFO. He knows the credit markets. He's telling me that there's interest rates have to go up from here. So if interest rates go up, you know, 200 basis points from here, what do you think, what's going to happen to cap rates? Yeah, so I think cap rates definitely would decompress as well. Um, we did model a decompression of cap rates in our refinance. Uh, so we, we modeled a one point increase in uh, rates. So we'd be refinancing at a four and a half percent rate. Or I'm sorry, we would be from, from current rates because we'd be refinancing into agency debt, right? Which is at, you know, safely three and a half percent right now. So we modeled the four and a half percent. And so that, that was kind of our risk mitigation in that sense. Um, but we definitely, that would incentivize us to refinance, sit and hold and, and yield because that's kind of the safety net that we build in with that value add. As we go in, we create that basis spread so that then we can just sit on that new debt. And even though that yield might not be where we wanted it, at least we can refinance it to that long-term agency debt um, at a good rate. So since you had the model out, I'm curious, did you model how high it would have to go before you ended up, you know, and a low single digit return? So we don't have the sensitivity analysis in the deck, but we could go over that absolutely okay. off table. So I'm sorry, what, where, what's your cap rate at acquisition and what's your cap rate at refi? So our cap rate at acquisition based on the historicals is three and a half percent. Okay. Um, and then our cap rate uh, after operations at stabilization, which is after uh, 16 months, is 6.4%. Like your cap rate is 6.4% after sale, is it? Yes. You, you're, you're, I'm saying when you're refi, what is the cap rate you're using on your appraisal? Oh, we're using a, uh, we're modeling uh, five basis points a year increase. So we're buying at a three and a half cap and then we're modeling a refinance. Uh, at 365? Right. And then you, then your stress was at that plus 100. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah. All right. I think I follow. Um, and what's the cash on cash yield after that? So the average cash on cash for the life of the deal, which we're modeling uh, for five years, is 10%. I believe it's in the deck. Mm -hmm, it is in the deck right here. And like I said, that yield is going to be low in year one as we're stabilizing the asset. And, and I apologize. I think there was some confusion. We're actually planning to refinance after 18 months. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I, I said three years. But, but so, so post refi, it's like 9%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually in the model, in 11, so. um, we do, because you're buying in Austin, we're coming in technically to three and a half cap based on the historicals, but uh, I apologize, I was wrong. In the model, we're actually modeling 4% cap rate. All right. So that'll actually give us a lower valuation than what we're buying at. Uh, so that's another way to be conservative. So, you know, my dad does some real estate and the guy that he works with is saying, you know, you need to get out, you know, get close to shore. This is crazy. So how would you, how would you respond to that? My main thing would be Austin and the fact that we do have so much fundamental demand drivers. And with COVID, they haven't actually been able to apply for as many permits as normal. So we're actually around 2,500 permits and 7,500 7, deliveries this year. So we're not, I mean, actually absorb 7,500 and deliver 2,500. So we're well over. We're actually, demand is well outpacing the supply. So people need a place to live and they're not developing in time. Part, partly permits, partly COVID. And then plus all of the different companies moving here. There's a lot of bigger companies that are not going to stop hiring employees here, and we're having 500 plus people move here a day. So people are going to need housing, regardless of the external circumstances, which we've hopefully underwritten for. Um, well, those technology companies are, are hiring a, a certain type of employee. Is that kind of employee going in Class C housing, or is that kind of employee going for the pool and the gym and the Class A? For every one uh, white collar employee that's brought into an area, typically three blue collar employees follow them. So that is that is a, a happy stat for us as well, because you need service industry individuals in order to serve these individuals who are coming into these higher technical jobs. So it definitely will support growth in our area as well. So I'm sorry, how, how many units are getting added in Austin this year? Uh, those are just the delivered units. So delivered only 2,500 because of the, some of the permitting issues and absorbed are 7,500 just from 2020 alone. So that's a huge spread in actual demand and supply. And how many are in construction now? I actually don't have that stat with me personally, currently. So you guys look super young, like you just got out of college. I mean, there's some guys out there that have been doing this for a long time, I'm sure. So what, you know, and we've seen materials, we've been looking around for this kind of stuff. 
what's your edge? Why, why you versus somebody that's been doing this for 10 or 15 years and has seen a couple of cycles? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a deal like this is very interesting because it's in the sweet spot of um, being big enough to deliver nice yield to get good property management and while at the same time it doesn't capture as much institutional interest. So we've spent the past two years absolutely berating brokers around Austin, um, getting really involved, getting connected with as many people as we can. And so we were able to get this deal off market. So no one else has actually looked at this deal. Um, it's just us and we were able to build that credibility from closing on Ventura, um, the 42 unit next door. And so by having that property, we were able to establish rapport. Um, we have a good relationship with the seller actually. And so we also have our partner, Joel, and he's very experienced, he's a partner. Uh, he's a mixture of KP, so he signed on tons of loans, GP as well as LP in over 4,000 doors. Uh, he's in Texas, Cleveland, California, uh, mostly in Texas. Is his bio in here? Yeah, it is. I can okay. actually show you on page two. And so uh, what's his role with you guys? So like I said, he would be helping us um, with guaranteeing the loan. He helps us with asset management, and then he also helps us raise equity. Oh, he's going to guarantee the loan? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's a Stanford MBA, uh, big background, over 4,000 units. How much money is he putting in? He's putting in, uh, I believe the general partnership in total is putting in 450,000. And how much did that sound? Uh, from Joel, we, I'd have to confirm, but I believe 150,000. And what's the total equity need on this? 1.9. Wait, so you guys are gonna put in 150 each and he's putting in 100? Mm -hmm. Is that what I heard? Okay. Well, that's great. So one of the things, uh, we both have a lot of passive gains over the last year or two because of the company being acquired. I've heard that appreciation is something that could be beneficial to us. Do you guys know much about the how this is going to be taxed? You know, how much depreciation could be available for us to offset some of our gains? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to do a cost segregation study the day that we close. What's that? So a cost segregation, um, an engineer comes in, they pick apart the property and essentially it's just a tax strategy to where you can take all of your depreciable asset value and pull it up to year one by saying, you know, for example, a property might depreciate over 27 and a half years, um, but landscaping might be 15 or, or chairs might be 10, et cetera. And so by taking that stuff, you can actually depreciate it a lot faster, which means you can write off those passive losses up front. Um, however, we would, you know, tell you to consult your CPA because we are not tax experts and we can't tell you exactly how this would um, Look for your personal yeah. situation. Yeah. And what if I would need to get out? If you need to get out of the deal, you can sell your shares at a discount and it's in our BPM as well, which we'd be happy to send you. And there's more detail as far as the actual exit strategy. You would have a, a way out, but it would be at a discount for sure if you were exiting prior to our who, who's, who Are you buying the out? It could be me. It could be another individual that you bring. Again, all this is detailed in the PPM, which we'd be happy to send you following the meeting for sure to give you more details. You can look over with your lawyer if you'd like. And then back to the value add piece. So you guys said you had some supply chain issues and I've been remodeling my kitchen and I can't get my electrician to plumb up to show up and you know, the tile takes six months to get and all that. I mean, what's, what's going to be different this time? Why do you, why do you think, I mean, you're going to be on budget and on time this time around? Well, now we have more units so we can order in more bulk and we can hold those things in storage preemptively. Uh, anticipating supply chain issues. And then also we've worked through a lot of the contractors who were more iffy and overbooked and we've solidified a core group of contractors who do all of our turns. And we also have, uh, we've consolidated our renovation plan to be very easy to replicate. So we're not doing different levels with different appliance types. We're doing one level with one appliance types and we're seeing that delivered. So that's easier to order, easier to store, easier to process, easier to communicate. And we have a a great property manager now who we understand the process with. We've worked out the kinks. And that property manager is a third party? Yes. Yeah, and within our third property manager, they actually have in-house construction management. Um, so we've been able to bring that on and that's been really efficient as far as um, getting all hands on deck, getting suppliers, vendors, um, stuff delivered, going straight to the supplier for stuff like appliances that have been difficult to get. Um, but so far our experience with Ventura it's been great labor-wise. Um, like some of the units, uh, we've been able to turn them 10K per door, um, go in and have them fully renovated as far as paint, floors, counters within 15 days, and then the rest of the time is just waiting on appliances. So. And then are you doing anything else right now or is this gonna be your only focus? Managing this deal in Ventura is our only focus right now. Um, and combining them to run them efficiently, not as one property, but as two. Properties coming to be one cohesive operation. So, 
All right, cool. Well, thanks for coming up to Denver. Uh, no, that probably wasn't convenient, but we'll have to definitely come down and take a look at this. So send us materials, it'd be great. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate right. you guys. Thanks. Sweet. All right, first of all, Jay and John, we've done a ton of things together. You've seen so many deals that we've done here in Denver, and then you guys have seen a bunch of deals. So thank you so much for your time. I thought it was it, this is gonna be invaluable for the audience. So one of the things I wanna do is give some action items and some things that they did well. You know, Van and Kyle are my boys. I think they're super talented, that's why they're here. But everyone can get better, so I'd love to go through what are some things that you liked, and what are some things that the audience and sponsors out there can do better on their pitch. So let's talk about sure. that. Sure, well, uh, first of all, uh, give them, um, high marks for their presence. They sat up at the table, they weren't sitting back, so you wanna be engaging. Um, they didn't stutter, they don't use a lot of uh, soft words or whatever, but they, they made eye contact the whole time. They made sure they were looking at whoever was talking, they weren't looking down at the deck, they didn't use the deck. One thing we see a lot of is when people get nervous, they just start kind of going like this, right. just going through and, and, and your, your eyes are glossed over. So I give them a lot of, of credit for that. I also think that for the most part, they were ready with crisp answers. They didn't fumble. Right. So I would start there. Cool, great. Jay, let's hammer them. What can the audience gather from what they did that you think they could do better? What could they have done better? Uh, sure, I had, I had four things, I guess. Um, the first was why Austin? And obviously we all heard of Austin and Austin's a hot market and all that, but, but what does that really mean? And so having a little more clarity around um, what's causing the growth. So Tesla's moved here, Apple's moved here. We have all this population growth and it doesn't need to be super granular, but those data points I think are, are great. One point they did make that I thought was excellent was that there's three blue collar workers uh, or three blue collar jobs that could create for every one white collar job. And this obviously this product is very much targeted at blue collar demographics. Um, the, the, the second thing was, what is value add? I think it's a relatively new concept. Most investors that we talk to are getting pitched class A apartments, new construction, or stuff that just got built and is trading within the first year or two. It's kind of almost the refinance. Mm -hmm. And so the whole concept of taking, you know, you know, dumpy class C apartments and then putting in new flooring and kitchens and, and tile and all that, and then re-renting them at two or $300 a month more, I think is a, if for, for any way, for the people we've talked to is a little bit of a newer concept concept or a less known concept. And so I think just walking through what that means and, and you know, kind of layman's language is mm -hmm. good. I think right there, there is an opportunity to talk about risk. Clearly, if we start off with, you know, pouring concrete and waiting for a 22 story building to go up and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of risk in that versus in their model, there's cash flow day one. Uh, so it feels less risky. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would have used that opportunity to say that because that's going to resonate, especially when we just said what we were looking for, kind of yield, right? lower risk. Love sorry. that. Uh, third thing was, I don't think they did a, a they, they did a little bit of it. They didn't do a good enough job about talking about how invested they are in this. So this is their only project. They're each putting 150 grand. I don't know what percent of their net worth is, but I'm sure it's a lot. This project has to go right for them. I mean, they're all in on this. And then they managed to get, um, you know, some gray hair that's actually going to guarantee a loan for them and put equity in as well. That's hugely comforting if I'm an investor that you aren't just two kids that kind of fell into this thing and are just trying to figure it out as you go. Um, again, it has to go right. And you're not working on anything else. I think that's a hugely compelling point. And then the last part is more of a technical thing. I didn't want to talk about numbers, but when they're throwing out these cap rates, there seemed to be a little bit of uncertainty, and then they didn't reference any comps. So comps are usually pretty easy to find. And so what are the five properties that have traded in the last 18 months within a mile or two of this one? And what justifies, whether it's three and a half percent or four and a half or whatever. And then, you know, when, when people say, what's your downside, which a lot of people are thinking about right now, we're in a rising interest rate environment purportedly. Um, you've got a, you know, a city that's booming. And so what happens when it backs up? I think having crisper answers around what happens if is probably pretty important. Even if you're not getting the model out and showing people, just talk about how the, the IRR assumption step down, you know, if it's 100 basis points more cap rate, 200 basis points cap rate, you know, et cetera. Yeah, so you nailed some great points. So let's summarize those. So the first one was explain the reason why on the MSA, right, on the city. So if it's Denver, Nashville, Dallas, Austin, maybe it's Bend, Oregon, you know, explain why. Show data drivers, show migration, 
what recent companies have moved there, like really know your city, right? So when you're raising money, know the market, be able to explain it, defend it, right? Exactly. Number two, explain the value proposition behind value add, right? Why is value add more compelling? And you gotta know your audience for this, but more compelling than class A. So one of the things you guys talked about was cash flow and then risk adjusted cash flow, right? So because there's income coming in all the way, you don't have two years where you're entitling and just have a piece of dirt. So be able to explain the value proposition behind buying maybe the most underutilized building in an area of progress. So really clearly define the value proposition of that. And then the third one that I really like that, which is why I love these guys is they're all in, right? So really show and why your interests are aligned with the investor you're sitting down there with, right? Is being able to clearly define, hey, look, I'm all in. This has to go well for me. I have no plan B. It's it. I burned the bridge. So the last one is, and something that we talk a lot about in the deals that we're doing, is you have to show worst case scenario. If all you do is talk about fairyland and all these things that are gonna go 100% well, you have to show the investor and your audience that you've thought about worst case scenario. That's something that I've learned a lot from you guys, right? We've been in the last 10 years, all things have done is appreciate and debt's gone down. So naturally we've crushed it, right? But being able to talk about, hey, 2007, eight, or another COVID, here's what we've done to show that we've considered that there's things could go bad. So those are the four things that we got from this, this pitch. I thought, I, like, I love these guys. So I think they're super talented, but everyone can get better. And I thought you guys did an awesome job articulating the four things that everyone can think about. Well, there's something that needs to be said here with these guys. Uh, and there may be a lot of young people starting in this business. They're clearly young. Um, I asked them a question, gave them a chance to address that, you know, what's their edge? There are going to be people who don't want to even ask that question, but it's sitting there in the back of their mind going, oh my gosh, these guys are very young. There's a lot of season. They need to embrace that and just say, yeah, you're right. And either go to, but it's it works for us, not against us. You know, we out hustle. These other guys that have been in for a while, they've made a lot of money. They don't, I don't feel like they, you know, turn over every stone or whatever analogy they want to use. Tie it back into the point, I've got $150,000 on this thing. All of a sudden I start, you know, having a lot of like, I feel like I'm connecting with you and I'm really liking you, but it's, it, you know, it can be challenging. Yeah, turn the negative or the doubt into yeah, something to say, that yeah, confident. laugh at right. it. Embrace right. the obvious. That's right. Love it. Hey, I appreciate it. Next time, we'll get some whiskey for you guys. All right, guys. How'd the Shark Tank feel? I think it went well. Um, I think from the beginning, uh, as you probably noticed, Kyle tried to make sure and establish the frame of, hey, we want to make sure that we're doing right for y'all. What's your story? What do you want out of this? And I think John, pretty sophisticated, was able to flip that back and say, no, 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 tell us about this deal. Tell us about you, what's going on here. Yeah, that's, that's the big game changer between pitching guys who are that talented and institutional, like those two gentlemen, is like, typically what you want to do in an investment pitch is say, we ask the questions, we hear about you, and then you give us information, and from there, we say our pitch. Because now I know what you want to hear, and I can tailor my pitch to that. So it's really, the first half of the pitch, most of the time, is us asking questions. And usually it goes very well. But John has like obviously done this many times, so he was like, no, actually you guys tell us about multifamily. And like, then he asks us questions on us now, he controls the conversation, and then from then on, they control the conversation. So I think that's a really clear point. I love that you guys said that because most people sit down at a pitch with investors and they're like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna say? And they think they have to articulate their words so like perfectly. And what people really wanna do is talk about themselves. So often, like the first question, like you guys is just tell me to tell your story. And then you get them comfortable, you get them talking. And then maybe at the last 10 minutes, they'll say, tell me about the deal and you can talk and they'll walk away feeling like, man, I love those guys. And really all they did was talk about themselves. Yeah. So I love that. I mean, that's really a, a more experienced, mature uh, move and mindset coming into a pitch. Walk, talk the audience through and tell us how much time went into this product and how well you guys knew the property because I think sometimes people are like have someone else put together the deck and they didn't even walk the property I mean how many hours are in this before you guys even sit down to talk to someone about a deal <sighs> dozens I would say maybe hundreds I mean because um, especially before we're gonna raise money and we're gonna go put millions of dollars on the line and put our names on a big loan do all this crazy stuff we're gonna make sure it's a good deal so I think that's kind of the easiest part walking into a deal like this is we know we have a good deal we know, I mean, like I said, we're putting our own money into it, our own family and friends money into it. Like it's a good deal, period. And like, that's, that's not really the selling point. 
kind of like Wolf of Wall Street. We're not saying, oh, this ballpoint pen is really good. It writes really well. We were just trying to figure out what are you in the market for? Exactly. Um, and I think the, the thing that I was expecting was kind of the story that they made up. It's like, you know, we have a lot of money. We're looking for yield. We kind of just want to place it and get cash flow. Um, and that's gonna that's a challenge of a deal like this because in Austin, like we said, you're buying really good real estate. Um, you're you're buying in a hot market, which means it's gonna have really high appreciation and it's gonna be less cash flow, less yield. And so that was like the instant challenge that I knew. And I think we were able to also leverage the question of oh, what's A class, what's B class, what's C class? Because I think I could like after we pieced together what that was, I kind of thought okay, well let's like combine the explanation of what a B C class asset is with yield because really the only thing he cares about is the fact that our yield is low in year one because it's a value add right. C class property in a hot market. And so we said, okay, well, we're actually able to take your issue and turn it into a good thing by buying the C class asset value add. So we're able to get good yield in a good market. And I think that was kind of like our, our strategy that took us 10 minutes to get to. You want to address their pain point immediately and not ignore it. And there we addressed, we, we identified it early what their pain point was going to be. It was that yield. And then we were like, all right, our whole focus has to be how we can flip that for them. So they can walk out of here saying that thing I really wanted to like, I really didn't like the whole yield thing about their presentation being low in year one. And we want to give them an answer before they leave. That's basically our point. Do you feel like you accomplished that? I feel like I hope that we sold the Austin market enough for them to feel comfortable about that low yield one and to feel confident about that refinance actually taking place in year two and our assumptions associated with that refinance because that's really the, the, the crux of the issue is, all right, if the yield is low in year one, it better be not low in year two and three and, and going forward. And so that's, you know, that's based on Austin. That's based on some of our assumptions about the business plan performance. And I, I think we did a decent job at articulating that. All right. Final question, guys. We got to wrap up. If you go back and do it again, what would you change in that conversation 20 minutes ago? I, I would definitely would have hit on the Austin. I think market, that's the most like salient thing to me that I know I have already. And then potentially the, the youth, I've done the youth pitch before. Um, when I raised money initially, I would tell people, you know, no one's going to work harder than me. I may be young, but like no one's going to work this hard. And then like I can definitely, we could have definitely gone into that a little bit more as well. Yeah, I think for me, like you said, I would have been a little stronger on the numbers as far as like the risk mitigation side. And I would have had a little bit more to say and a little bit more of a narrative to push of, hey, here's our downside and how we're protecting against it. Um, as opposed to saying like, hey, you know, let's go offsite to a sensitivity table. Um, I'd probably have a better story ready. Awesome. Well, YouTube viewers out there, leave your comments, what they do well, what's your critique, what's your two cents. We read it, we like it, hit up on DMs, and make sure you subscribe and like this video. Guys, this was awesome. Thanks for coming out to Denver again. You guys crushed it, man. Proud of you guys. Thank you. That was great. You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. Join the conversation. 